Welcome to the Village Podcast. I am your host, Nicole Trumpio. My why has always been to empower women and amplify the voices of mothers. We created the village to share stories and ideas to embody the innate wisdom of a village, but on a modern day platform. I hope this podcast inspires, educates, and informs you and brings you the joy, love, and light you deserve. Welcome to the village. Welcome, Dr. Second, to the podcast. We're so excited for this episode. I feel like this episode is going to be one of the most important and highly viewed episodes from the whole series. Dr. Second is one of the most famous and renowned endometriosis surgeons in the world. I am lucky enough to know him on a personal level. I had the privilege of him being my OBGYN when I was in New York City, and it's when I first learned about endometriosis. Um, Years later and three babies later, I have a million friends that have endometriosis in some form or fashion, because I know that there's different types, which we'll learn more about today. And I couldn't think of anyone better to talk to than Dr. Second. You are amazing. You also have a lot of different um, charitable galas and uh, fundraisers to raise money and awareness for endometriosis. And he works with like the biggest celebrities on the planet. So, (laughs) which, you know, I, I think that was like, it was not even like, the biggest celebrities was also like the coolest celebrities too, because you're just like the best doctor ever. Um, we're, so we're really um, humbled and honored to be able to talk to you today. I think there's a lot of questions out there that people have on this topic, and I, I can't think of anyone better to talk to. So Dr. Second, welcome to the podcast. Nice to be here. Thank you, Nicole. I'm really happy to see you again after so many years. Right. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know that you're in surgery a lot and in appointments and, and, you know, serving women and helping women. So thank you for taking the time to speak to us today. Um, Our focus on this topic is endometriosis. So for those of you that don't know what it is, I'm going to ask the big question. What is endometriosis? Well, after more than three decades, I've been dealing with it and I'm still learning what endometriosis is myself. But in a, Mm -hmm. in a broad sense, I can say endometriosis is a disease of menstruation. It is painful menstruation that has associated symptoms of other organs like bowel symptoms, pain with intimacy, uh, you know, chest pain at times, leg pain, sciatic. So it has many, many faces of thousand faces that it can present. It is a disease of women and 10% of women on the average, 10%, 10% have it. Maybe more, probably more. Mm. Many women think it is normal to have painful periods at times, even painful other things, including including fertility world, don't know about endometriosis. Endometriosis is also the most known cause of fertility problems in women. So in that right. sense, endometriosis is, is like a, uh, is, is like a public health uh, associated disease. It's, it really involves the heart of our society, which are the women. It involves mm-hmm. their, their issues, you know. Uh, imagine a woman every month uh, losing time four or five days with painful menstruation, cannot move, excruciating, debilitating pain, taking tons of pain medication. It doesn't help. Over the years, it gradually symptoms gets more serious. They lose work. They lose, uh, you know, they lose uh, love. You know, they lose, they lose relationships. So yeah. that's why. It's much more than one in 10. It involves maybe one in 10 women as a disease, but it also involves their children, their, their loved ones, their boyfriend, the husband, their mothers, parents, in-laws, you know, it does involve a lot of people around one person and it, it goes on 
life cycle, reproductive life cycle. You know, it, it really is a, in the end, politically, it becomes a reproductive justice issue. It really make it's a disease that women uh, women makes women of a less uh, less appreciated in their uh, in their life in society. This disease wow. pulls them down. Really, it does. Wow, it is the disease of the next chance century. We will talk more and more. I think I'm lucky to have people like you. I'm honored. I'm really humbled that you recognize what I try to do. Aside my own, obviously, private practice, we through the foundation, we be, we became the public voice for women to create awareness, to fund, you know, um, serious research. research. We have uh, we have created more than a million dollar research seed money, and these individuals got later major NIH grant in millions through our initiation and introduction to the research world, we changed the the New York State uh, reproductive teaching uh, curriculum in high school, wow. mandatory teaching of reproductive health from uh, yeah. age 13 and to 16, 17. So endometriosis becomes an issue that they learn, you know, killer cramps, serious uh, period problems are not normal and should be, endometriosis should be considered early. We believe that early diagnosis, timely detection of the disease is the best way to prevent future complications that's got to do with, you know, end up multiple surgeries to be pre prevented, major organ removals, hysterectomy, infertility to be prevented. I think in that sense, this is a serious, serious subject that represents reproductive justice for women, in my opinion. Wow. That makes my heart sink that, or like, I'm just so glad that you're, you're framing it in that way, because I think, you know, <laughs> men are really tough on women, like, oh, you just have your period. And yeah, they really, really bring us down or people in our life, as you said, relationships, they get damaged because we naturally go through this cycle. And sometimes it's not fun for for some people. And you're just a drama queen if you're not like a perfect angel and, and controlled and, you know, um, strong, putting on a strong facade through it all. Um, and so is that why endometriosis is still a new topic? Has it just been like overshadowed? Well, uh, obviously, um, it, you know, the, the disease is on the average, it takes 10 years, close to 10 years for the disease to be diagnosed properly, rightfully. I mean, until it is, so it's the most misdiagnosed, it's the most mis, mismanaged and mistreated disease in women. So it takes on the average 10 years to misdiagnose. And it is, it is the, the, uh, you know, women are being looked at as if in the pain that or the complaints they have is not, is in their heads. You know, it's, a, it's, they're making it up, you know, they're making up for something that they cannot articulate and they allude to the fact that it's the deal with their fear. This has been like that for centuries. I mean, yeah. this comes from the, also the whole attitude, public tabooistic uh, attitude uh, towards female issues versus men's issues. As you know, I mean, the, if it is men's, uh, issue that's got to do with erection or other things that you can line up to any complaint. There are tons of medications and the, the whole uh, TV world is uh, drowning with, with advertisement and things like that. When it's for women, you don't see it much, you know, and nobody wow. wants to talk to it. So, I mean, classically, the word hysteria and the word hysterectomy are associated closely with all complaints of endometriosis. So in the past, it is, it was the hysteria. The, the women are called hysteric who, who had painful periods, who, who went out of breath and due to pain, they debilitingly, they were on the floor, whatever. They couldn't function. They were named as hysteric women. They were put to mental health institutions, as you know, in Victorian times in London. <laughs> you know, 90% of the patients in the mental institute were women and they were then forced to have hysterectomies, you know. They were put straight jackets and, and things like wow. that, hospitalized to mental institution. 
until until Freud came. So his, so Freud his direct said, means. Listen, this is Freud said it's his hysteria. It's in the it's something else. It's not really it's something to do with mental things. At least it, it, the woman was uh, trying were were vindicated to a degree, but still it was mental thing. So until late, you know, until late seventies, uh, we still have we still have in gynecology book psychosomatic disease, and these complaints were the main chapters in these books. I'm not telling you, and this is 30 years ago, 40 years ago, main gynecological textbook where wow. we learned they had, we had psychosomatic gynecology and endometriosis was all the symptoms of endometriosis was psychosomatically represented there. Thank God they're wow. not there anymore. So when does, when did en endometriosis first get diagnosed then? Like when well, did they the person, actually know the person, it was the thing? The person who called endometriosis is 1922, a guy named Samson from mm -hmm. John Hopkins. Actually, he was from um, Syracuse, New York, very bright man, pathologist, named this disease endometriosis, linking it to the periods that retrogradely migrate inside. So he said these women were having similar periods during their menses as they out, outside, the mini bleedings do happen inside. And these chocolate cysts and these uh, obstructive fibrotic inflammatory lesions born, born to that. Since then, obviously, many things have changed. But the first man they call it called endometriosis was Samson. Before that, yeah. we knew that there was something happening with these glands being found outside the uterus. The same glands were implanted. It was the same gland, but nobody called it endometriosis. They thought it came from birth or it came from other other reasons. But Samson is the yeah. first guy who really called endo. Today, we have DNA evidence, pure mm -hmm. evidence. Samson was right. It is really Got the you. period that goes backwards. Probably as early as the girl is born, you know, there's maternal hormones pull back during that time, the female born has also mini period. And we, we can detect the six to 10 per six percent of the time we see blood in, in the, you know, in newborn females vagina that's got to do with her own blood. So there is mini period that can happen as early as that, that newborn period. And there's wow. also mini periods happen before an individual girl, an adolescence, we call it telarch, at that between the ages of eight, eight to twelve. At that mm -hmm. time, retrograde transfer before it really builds up against cervix and becomes period. There's a high possibility the periods could could occur backwards and implant as early because ninety percent of the time, the symptoms of endometriosis goes back to adolescent period between the age of 12 ah. and 16. Interesting. And so, yeah, it increases, yeah. And so the education that you are putting into the curriculum in New York, what like what age is that education starting at? It is uh, fresh, the high school, early high school years. Or Which late is middle how... school years. So uh, whenever they're exposed to reproductive health, the the motto yeah. is uh, killer clamps are not normal. If there is yeah, and so clamps, when you say when you say, when you say killer cramps, so I know that period can be a dull pain and just make you a little. For me, I I never had you know bad period pains, but my best friend in the whole wide world, when we're at school, like grade seven, she would just have to stay home for like three days. There you go. You so know? so that kind of. Any period that period pain that's debilitating to hold a yep. uh, young girl from school, social activities, sports, whatever, more than, you know, a day of period is fine. A painful period, you know, they can with the regular uh, analgesic is fine, but anything that lasts more than one day, especially goes over two days, stretches to one week and they cannot get up. There's a lot of bowel symptoms like nausea, throwing up, that kind of stuff along with it. 
they are serious aspects of the disease symptoms, right? 80 per 90 percent, along with the pain of the period, there is bowel symptoms, GI symptoms with it. So that's, yeah, that's an aspect that we should recognize right away. So from what I understand, endometriosis can be m heavier involved in the, the bowel or in the cervix. Is that correct? So endometriosis is, is when, yeah, it is what we call prostaglandins, right? In general, uh, the endo patients, typically these girls have very heavy bleeding as early age adolescents, mm -hmm. very painful, excruciating cramps with periods lasting more than one day, stretching to three, four days. Along with that, they typically have typically have significant bowel symptoms like nausea, throwing up, diarrhea, constipation, that kind of series of things. And it should be, uh, and it, it is, uh, it is uh, cyclical. So these symptoms, bowel symptoms basically flare up with the period. So we yeah. have to recognize that the nurses in the hospital, in, in the, in the school, the, the parents, mothers, mothers should know. Yeah. Like the song goes, your mother should know, you know, mother should know endometriosis, especially mothers who have endometriosis themselves. Their children, their girls may have four to five times as much as uh, other population prone to have. It's familial. It's genetic. So it's, it's genetic. It is genetic. Yep. It's genetic. So but this can't be called... You cannot find single gene. There's multi genes that are involved. We don't have a specific gene yet, even though some genes are identified, but they're also identified with other things. So it's definitely not caused by anything. It can really never not. be. It's basically, it is, it is uh, familial and early yeah. recognition is the best way to prevent and timely intervention. Birth controls, pills have a very strong, uh, very powerful impact positively to really uh, s minimize the amount of bleeding and even taking continuously. So best first line of approach to this along yeah. with uh, pain medications that are not non, non opioid as particularly, we got to be if very careful. If you're taking birth control pills to, um, did you say to prevent, or is it more like a band aid for well, it? The, just the, the, birth, to symptoms. manage the to manage the the uh, pain, the, the the pain obviously to manage the amount of bleeding to decrease the bleeding and yeah. to decrease the ovulation to prevent ovulation. Birth control is the best first line approach. They are management. Mm -hmm. They don't treat endometriosis, but they may put hold on the disease to progress most likely, and ah, it should be, be given continuously too. So any woman who takes birth control pills yet still have pain, that's the first line of, uh, first line of high degree of suspicion for the disease. Yeah. This and does that apply to like an IUD as well or other kinds of birth control well, or IUD just is also similar. Some women cannot take birth control pills. We, we may give uh, progestone, uh, IUD to them like Miranda. Yeah. And yep. they do the similar job. Interesting. Any any other forms of birth control or any other? Well, there is also stronger medication that, that really we call. It used to be in the past Lupron, but it is a very strong drug that causes menop uh, you know menopausal symptoms. Now we have Orilisa also, uh, or other drugs on that line, more powerful. Uh, they're not birth control pills, but they also stop. Uh, centrally from the brain wise, it can block, uh, block roots, you know, main hormones and, uh, and periods are, are diminished in, in uh, occurrence. So they are also very helpful. They're, they're more advanced drugs now, but not everybody can tolerate them, but their For first sure. line of, yeah, first line of treatment before any surgery. But in the end, yeah, yeah. unfortunately, uh, only surgery treats the disease. So if the symptoms persist despite these medications being used in different format and still, uh, you know, patient experiences similar pain, you can't wait on those patients, patients in general. It, they need to be, uh, they need to be, uh, uh, you know, one day in and out. It should be excised. 
And that is the treatment. And it should be excised and looked under microscope. You know, you have to understand endometriosis is an inflammation. Yeah. It creates inflammation inside. And that inflammation turns out to be a scar tissue. And that mm. scar tissue attaches to organs and causes organ dysfunction, constipation, diarrhea, later when they're sexually active, severe pain with deep contact. Inflammation is the main cause of fatigue, tiredness, not feeling well, feeling down. I mean, it's psychologically, it opens the door for, especially when they are not understood from one doctor to another, nobody gives an answer for years. There's severe anxiety, anger, leading doors to depression and, you know, psychotherapy is this, that, you name it. I mean, these women really uh, mentally are let out in a, in a limbo and uh, yeah. gets out of orbit in a way. They lose it. I, I feel so bad when there's 10 years, they have so many different treatments, sometimes for IBS, sometimes with many different uh, leak, ascend, uh, leak gut syndrome, this, that diagnose of celiac disease, uh, that kind of thing, which has, which is not true, really. They have, nobody asked this, that magic question. Hey, could it be, are you really having all these things with your period? Of, of course, yeah. Nobody asked that magic question of, is your periods also painful? Is your, um, is your symptoms catamanial, in other words, cyclical, coinciding with periods? That question, that's the magic question that really dissolves it. It's the, it's the piece that really makes the puzzle complete and you can see everything clearly. That yeah. Magic question, the so it, it sounds like what you're saying though, it sounds like if you have endometriosis, you, the only way to cure it is to, or stop it progressing without, you know, indefinitely or indefinitely is you have to have the surgery. Well, is that right? If, if you have symptoms and if you have organ dysfunction, that scar tissue has to be removed. There's no medicine that can remove the scar tissue. So it's going to, you could take the pill and it may progress slower or take some kind of birth control and it may progress slower, but eventually it's going to progress. So you can have a hysterectomy if you've, would that even cure it actually as well? well or no? Look, there are two. There are cons many times the treatment is conservatory, uh, conservative. So you, you, no organs are removed. If it's in the ovary, there are three types of endometriosis. One is lining of the peritoneum inner mm -hmm. lining. That's called superficial endometriosis. There's deep endometriosis, which could be deep into the ovary. We call it as cyst, that's chocolate cyst. And a deeper endometriosis that causes neuropathy or sciatic or also bowel obstruction or kidney outlets, you know, obstruction causes uh, swelling of the kidney. That's deep yeah. endometrium. These needs, all of them need, unfortunately, surgery, but they need to be diagnosed timely. We have patients who lose, loses their kidneys. We have patients who end up having pieces of bowel needs to be resected, not only one area, two, three areas. We have women Monthly having short, shortness of breath, endometriosis in their thoracic cavity, half of their lung is filled with air due to holes in their diaphragm. That's endometriosis. These women are, are really not wow. diagnosed timely because doctors don't know that. So one of the duties of the foundation, educate doctors in, in different type of endometriosis that we see. Yeah. We uh, make them aware so they don't miss that. So, and if you're, cause you know, I come from the middle of nowhere. I don't know if the doctors surrounding my area would know about this. Like I know my best friend definitely wasn't diagnosed with it. And you know, she sounds like the right case, especially at a really young age. So if you don't have a doctor that would diagnose you, how can you help yourself in this circumstance? Look, every country, in every country today, every part of the world, there yeah. are doctors, I assure you, who knows what endometriosis is. And with the, in the age of internet, you can find that doctor. So I, you just have you. to not take no for an answer and find somebody no that will exactly. diagnose you. So if the doctor thank says God no, also, mm -mm. yeah. Thank God there's so many, so many groups in Facebook, in Instagram. Yeah. Uh, 
active at all, but the, the, there are personally they the women talk among themselves in every country. There is some degree of women association that knows what's going on. They really direct you to to doctors right. who knows what to, in general. Not every doctor yeah. do the same thing. There's the variances from one doctor to another. But the idea is to when somebody commits themselves for surgery, they deserve to be treated appro- properly. So yeah. doctors have ethical obligation to do correct surgery and remove the disease uh, so they can sell, tell honestly that the remove is, disease is, is removed. It should be and so examined with under the, pathology. Yeah. yeah, so with the surgery, I remember you coming out of surgery one day and telling me that you, it's like by microscope, right? It's very... Well, almost um, very microscopic, yes. Very, it's big, very it's, fine surgery that you're doing. It's a precision-based removal, yes. Very precise surgery. And so what what are the kind of statistics of successful removals versus, like, is it, is, are some cases harder than others, or is it do you have to go back for a second surgery in some instances? Once you've removed it, is it gone forever? You well, know... In, in general, if the doctor does not burn or cause more damage in, inside to thinking that they are removing disease, many, you know, unfortunately, many doctors tend to burn or try to use laser, this and that. They don't really, they may destruct the lesion superficially, but like the tip of the iceberg, the, the deep disease stay there. And if, if, if the disease is excised, 90% of the time, patients do exceptionally well. Mm-hmm. However, over the run of four or five years, 50% of the time, pain comes back if they are having s- periods. But only <clears throat> this pain, 50% comes back, but all, the level of pain is not more than 30% of what it was in general. And only in my practice, one out of 10 patients get reoperated. This is for conservative surgery, when you don't remove organs and things like that. If patients have hysterectomy, when they, they're done with their child childbearing duties, whatever, they, they design that timing. Uh, if they have definitive treat- treatment involves some degree of uterine removal plus endo removal. But in some women, that because those women also have disease inside their uteruses, which we call adenomyosis. Which what is, is that? Endometriosis inside the uterus, uh, inside okay. the uterine muscle. They bleed so heavy, typically later in around 30s and on, typically. Yeah. You see them earlier too, but those women deserve to have, you know, by choice, hysterectomy. This episode is brought to you by Bumpsuit, the modern company redefining maternity and beyond. As a mom of three, I've tried every single baby carrier on the market. And at Bumpsuit, we came up with the best baby carrier out there. We took all the problems from the baby carriers we loved and we solved them in this one baby carrier called the Armadillo. The Armadillo has a lot of different pockets for your phone, your keys. It even has a space for your water bottle to hang from. It has a weather cover. It's got a back lumbar for that support, especially after giving birth. It is great for newborns up until, I mean, my three and a half year olds still ask for it. Go to bumpsuit.co. That's bumpsuit.co. Use the code THEVILLAGE20 for 20% off your entire order and get an armadillo baby carrier. Do yourself a favor. This is such a common thing, right? Like how many how many women are diagnosed with endometriosis? I know there's so many that are undiagnosed, but how common is this today? Well, I said, I said disease, uh, as a disease is 10%. 10% my estimation, one, uh, close to 17% up to 20% of women may have another yep. 10% may have as a condition that they're not aware. They are either infertile, that they don't know, they never had kids, but also has symptoms, never thought it was serious. Disease could be silent in some women who cannot get pregnant. You know, 40 wow. to 50, 60% of the women 
who have fertility problems have endometriosis. Wow. So you could actually have endometriosis, but not have painful periods, like not have any symptoms. No, you, you do have some degree of symptoms, but you think it's normal. Culturally or whatever is imposed in your cultural upbearing that, you know, woman, you're a woman, you're going to have painful periods. So the, the level of voicing that, that pain differs uh, to the individual. Some women have very high threshold. They are demanding jobs, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're hitting the road, they're, you know, yeah. prosecutors, I, judges. Uh, when they come with endo, PhD students, their endo is the worst because they have bitten their, their tongue um, and, and, uh, you know, bared the pain all their life. They're against the wall. Endo is so severe, blocking their kidney outlets or seriously. I've seen so many of them. Typically, I call them as, uh, that's endo personality. I call some woman really bears the pain to the end. And when wow. their inside is all destruct, the disease have eaten away. Uh, the, their uteruses, their bowel, all these nerves are all tangled inside. It's the, wow. it's, the surgery for these women are worse than any cancer surgery you can imagine. Cancer surgeons run away from endo disease because they make them look bad. You understand? Disease is so challenging surgically. Endo surgery is much difficult. Advanced endo surgery. I mean, advanced wow. disease is much difficult than any cancer surgery. Any cancer surgery. And everybody, wow. surgeons know this. So, okay. How is it actually diagnosed? Is it like an ultrasound or is it by examination? You got, believe, you, you got to have a doctor who believes in the patient. The patient is not making it up. The patient then doesn't come to a doctor for nothing for pain. They, when they say they have pain, they have pain. The right questions have to be asked by the, by the physician. Are your pain how many days? Define me out of 10. What's the scale of pain? Is your ovulation painful? Is it one-sided? One-sidedness or uniqueness to one side means a lot. Do you bleed heavy? Do you have clots? How many days? Do you have urinary symptoms with it? You have to really focus every organ. You have urinary symptoms with it. You have bowel symptoms. Do you have Nausea, vomiting, p p throwing up, uh, bloating, gas. Do you, do you, uh, have intestinal cramps with it? Do you have constipation? Do you have painful bowel movements? Do you have diarrhea, loose, loose stools, especially flaring up around the time of period with the period? Yeah. During intimacy sex, do you have painful sex? Do you have painful orgasm or, uh, you know, with the, with the, um, some woman comes to say, I have, during masturbation, we have, they can't, you know, they openly say that climax yeah. is painful. They openly say that. And you have to also ask the question. They may not bring it up. They are astonished and happy to answer when you ask the question. Yeah, um, absolutely. And also laterality, um, uh, like leg pain. Do you have leg pain coming front of your leg, back of your leg, like sciatic pain, inner the crural area. I mean, you have to really ask where the nerves, you have to know where your nerves are. And we yeah. ask all these questions. And many times, many times, 90% of the time, these among these variables or component of organs, 90% of the time, at least three organs are involved. And that speaks for itself. When you check the woman, they're very tender. We do a sonogram. We see things that women don't see. We look at the uterus, uterine size, whether there's adenomyosis, if there's an cyst in the ovaries, and we put the probe if they are sensitive to their yeah. pain, and we mark it, we, we kind of map it. So good doctors know what they're doing. If you're really so doing focus you, on this, you can't miss endometriosis. Even prior surgery, 95% of the time, you know the patient have endometriosis. So when so, you're diagnosing, so you will ask the questions, you would understand if there's a likelihood that there is, is endometriosis um, present, then you would do a sonogram and map the cervix to where if an area is tender, that means there's endometriosis there. Yeah, you you kind of map it in my you know, the painful location, the right side, left side, the, yeah. the top of vagina, cul-de-sac. So you mark it on your, we have a diagram in the office. 
And then, so, so what? Always, Mark, well, it's more on the right side, left side. Many times, when patients say, I have more pain on the right side, they have more lesions on that side that they point Interesting. out. Interesting. So, so is the next step from this point surgery? So you understand well, where all the lesions? Well, this, you know, typically we don't tell people you should have surgery, but it's, it's that the autonomy belongs to the individual. They say, I need surgery and we move forward. We never, I, of course, I support immediately. I tell them other than surgery at this stage, there's not much I can do. There's Got no you. medicine to help, to help to get rid of the lesions. So, but ethically, we let the woman say that, okay, please doc doctor, do my surgery, then you move on. This is and not cancer. This is not something that kills you. So it's the woman's uh, autonomy that really ethically puts her in this, because surgery is surgery, you know? It's endometrial surgery is not easy. There's unintended consequences of the surgery, which is called complications. It's more than other surgeries. So, and you really the don't know. Should realize that, yeah. You really don't know like the magnitude of it until you actually go into surgery, right? Well, many times you know the the advanced the, the degree of uh, disease inside. Many times you know, but sometimes there's ten to fifteen time, percent there's uh, disease on on predicted areas. So you have you have to know how to deal with it. Technically, technically, the surgeon should have the skills of suturing and, and precision surgical skills, along with uh, very good surgical technique of suturing under video uh, scope. So it's very yeah. not easy. I mean, seriously, that's that part. You have to really fix every hole that's created. Many times you end up with a hole on bladder, rectum. You need that. That needs to be fixed so nicely. It heals without any problem. Wow. But the disease gets removed. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, so it is possible to live with endometriosis. Is it possible to like get pregnant and have children and have, you know, healthy, successful pregnancies and labors with? Of course. I mean, patient, many patients, 80% of the patients do get pregnant. Yeah. That's a disease assume, because it causes inflammation. Molecularly, it interferes with pregnancy, all these inflammatory molecules, plus the organs and tubes, ovaries are distorted. The eggs do not get picked up because of the tube being involved or the, the overall inflammation. So once they are all corrected, things do move natural pregnancy. Even assisted pregnancies are more successful after good surgery. Yeah. But you can, you can. Okay. So if you can get pregnant without having the surgery. So I have a friend that has severe endometriosis. Um, and wants to get pregnant and can get pregnant. And if she gets pregnant, will the endometriosis, is there any chances that that can interfere with? Once she is pregnant, like cause miscarriage or well, it's anything like that. that? Endometriosis may cause uh, pregnancy loss, mm. miscarriages, and and uh, early premature labor or placental <clears throat> implantation problems, like uh, third trimester bleeding and stuff. But truthfully, even though in large statistics these numbers pop out, in general. Uh, I, in my experience, they have uneventful pregnancies. They have successful you. outcome. Yes. Because you are an OBGYN as well. So you're dealing with just, you know, women that you maybe know have endometriosis, haven't had the surgery and have successful pregnancies and labors, right? Yep. So at what point? So that is just information that doesn't have any kind of like research behind it that endo can actually cause a miscarriage or well, statistically, or... look statistically in big numbers there are some some elements uh, some numbers pointing to that but i i don't think uh, if it's treated it is not you know in my opinion it's yeah it is not successful pregnancies are always if it's not treated 
once they are not treated, we see more miscarriages, yes, with these women. And many times these statistics are done in populations where endo is not treated. So it makes sense. I mean, if you, the, your uterus is involved with endo and you have pregnancy and chances of losing the pregnancy is that obviously. If there's wow. big uh, ovarian cyst that's ruptured inside, uh, it does affect the outcome of pregnancy, obviously. This needs to be treated. And best treatment is surgery, quality and timely intervention and good surgery, along with good care afterwards, good follow up, uh, you know, until it's, she's ready to get pregnant. There's nothing that you can do like diet wise or there's no natural vitamin or um, mineral you can, that you can manage symptoms with those. There's nothing against right. diet, anti inflammatory diet. You're it's as good as you can do it. I mean, it, and it's good for everything, for your heart, for your longevity, for everything else you do in life. It's about anti-inflammation. Guess what? But you... Endo is a major inflammation. So right. unfortunately, it doesn't, these things do not get rid of already occurring into inflammation inside. So the bottom line is once you clean it, Mm -hmm. And you can take all these management issues with diet, acupuncture, exercise, you know, things like that. It does have, certainly it helps. There's no anything, doubt. any anti inflammatory kind of lifestyle, diet. Um, I'll tell you mine. Supplement, yeah. Diet. Vegetarian. Of olive oil dishes with vegetables and the beans and, you know, like fish everything else with lots of lemon on it with the herbs, yeah. salad that does it so it moves your bowels it is it is good for your heart yeah then that's proven no no red meat no meat well, you know, except for fish in moderation i believe yeah in right my diet red meat is allowed in moderation yeah. I mean, if you think about when we lived in primal times, it's like you wouldn't eat meat every day. It would be like when you got the, you know, the catch. <laughs> so we were eating it a lot less. It wasn't like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, just all the time. Meat, meat, meat. Um, so when you do have the surgery, what is like their recovery time like? Well, these are minimally invasive procedures. Uh -huh. Every doctor has their own way of doing it. Uh, there are two types of minimally invasive surgery today. I, I, ch I, my choice is the real scarless version. We use yeah. only three entries, five millimeters. Some doctors use robots. When you said three entries, three entries, no, so three incisions, three incisions. They are yeah. five millimeter, almost scarless. You don't even see. You 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 know what five millimeter is five only one fifth of are an you, inch. Are you going in through the like abdomen? One is from... suprapubic through the belly button. One is from the right through the belly button. Yeah, that, that's the scope. That's the camera goes there, and the other two is supra just beyond the bikini line. Yeah. Okay. Line and one from the 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 uh, from the one side. So they are. When you close them, they, you close them with like plastic sutures. You don't even see them when they heal. Absolutely not. Unfortunately, when with robotic, when people, some people do it with robotic, it's a fashion now. I, yeah. I'm not into, I do robotics, but maybe for hysterectomy, for fibroids and stuff. But for endosurgery, I do not recommend ro robotic approach because robots, do, with robot, you do not have uh, feedback, haptic feedback. You don't feel the tissues. Yeah, many times and also robotic instruments, as much as they advertise, it's not as as uh, precise as precision based. Base. It's there's got very big claws and things like that. It's it's hard to. There's a lot of things. If there's emergency, it's a setup that doctor is not even scrub sitting on a chair. If something wrong happens, it's hard to get back to the normal surgicals. There are a lot of other things. These are too much detail, but. The bottom line, minimal invasive approach, scholars approach, the woman goes home the same day. Yeah. And immediate recovery is three, four days. She's back to almost normal life. Uh, totally. We give them 10 days before going back to work. 
And, you know, they, they go back to work in one week, usually. Wow. And there's no and big the, incision. Right. And then after that, you just, um, do you recommend, like, say it was me and I've had three kids and I do the surgery and I, wa I don't want to have a hysterectomy at this point in my life because I don't know if I want to have another kid. Do I go on the pill after that or how is there a... Well, if you're having painful periods, you should. If you're not having painful periods, uh, usually after three kids, <clears throat> I think uh, you're, sometimes the endo symptoms are less uh, because the Not flow you. of the blood is easy out of your uterus in general. I guess uh, my question was more like once you've had the surgery, it's safe you have it at a younger age, like you have it in your teens. Is there a is that it comes back right so you could have to have like another surgery in your 30s or something well it, it, it that's why it, it does again it it takes it takes it doesn't come back it is excised as much as as opposed to if it's fulgurated or laser treated so got you again 10 percent of the girls 10 in some cases 20 25 but uh, you know, 10 to 25 percent, there's re re repeat surgery. Even mm -hmm. though you repeat surgery, the amount of disease you find inside, not as much as it was uh, the first before. time. So, so pain coming back does not mean that endo is back. Really. Got you. It's not. But the best thing is if you're young, not ready for kids, the best thing is to, to minimize the amount of bleeding by birth control pills. You can mm -hmm. take cyclically or continuous and to prevent ovulation in the same manner. So birth control pills are the key for management until yeah. you're ready to, to have uh, family. Uh, that's the real approach, real management approach. Yeah. And so what if you find out young that you have it when you're younger and what is the recommended approach though? Would it be to have the surgery ASAP or wait and just manage the pain and have it when you're a little older before you want to have kids? I think early intervention, but timely intervention. I think these women should be followed for a while on birth control pills and they should be informed. Their knowledge should be up there. So they make the decision. Okay. This is the time I move in. I need to take care of this, they should make their decision. So I propose, I propose to follow a young girl, maybe six months to three years and see mm -hmm. how she does. And at that time with the family being also part of decision making, you know, there's, there could be intervention and cleaning early. I think many women, especially in college years, forget about their periods and they suffer, nobody knows, and they move, they become 26, 27. The, career starts and, you know, marriage, this, that, suddenly they know they have endo at the age of 32, 34. Yeah. Now they're ready to get pregnant. They cannot get pregnant. It's a, it's a serious because it's an issue for that. So early, early recognition detection is key, especially yeah. around college years or pre-college years. That area is very important. And then just monitoring after you've had the surgery to see. Yeah. Cause can like it after the surgery. Say after the surgery, you've cleaned everything and you got everything. Because um, when you say you do like 10% uh, of cases, well, one in 10, you'll have to do a re-surgery for it. Is that because you didn't get everything or is that because it comes back, like it grows or not grows back, but well, it even, manifests? Even with me, it is most likely I, I may not gotten everything. And yeah. the, the, the disease comes back. If the, she's having period, there's a... Uh, disease may come back. Also, scar tissue forms, you know, not every endo ends up with a scar and it attaches one organ to another. I mean, as long as they are hormonal, this is an estrogen sensitive disease. As long as you got estrogen every month, the disease is feeding on that. So um, that's part of the real reality. Yeah. So what about, yeah, okay. Got you. That makes sense why the pill is, is helping just to slow it down. So, okay. And then what about, so one, if you've had a hysterectomy, there's no more endometriosis. Doesn't exist. Well, it's true, but with the hysterectomy, you have to clean the rest of the endo too. Hysterectomy yeah. is a definitive treatment 
provided that the doctor cleans the endo around the real endo outside the uterus. Endo is the disease outside the uterus. Removing the uterus does not treat the disease that's outside the uterus. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it removes the origin of the endo, which is comes from the endometrium. The so it could the keep growing. It could keep persisting yeah, after you get a hysterectomy if it's not the uterus. Yeah. If if it's not re if if you remove the uter the if you do a hysterectomy but you don't remove all the endo. The, 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 the pain disease, continues. Pain continues. Can, really? Even that's if there's why, no... That's why many women, it's a saying out there, hysterectomy doesn't treat endometriosis. Hysterectomy treats part of the endometriosis. That is to do with the uterus. But the endo is the disease outside the uterus. You need mm -hmm. to remove the disease outside the uterus. So endo occurs from the period that retrogradely reflux back and those mm. period implants. So that's why you have to uh, clean the origin of the the period okay. to treat yeah. the overall for definitive purposes. But if the disease implanted already forms scar tissue, removing the uterus doesn't remove the scar tissue on the appendix, on the bowel, on the side walls, on the nerves, on the rectum, on top of the vagina. So you need to clean all of those things. So. Every organ you touch, you need to have the ability to handle that. So that's what makes the disease difficult to treat for every doctor. Yeah. And so can the disease can still progress more even after you've had a hysterectomy or does it just stay well, where if you at? have ovaries, it, it may. Because uh -huh. if you have estrogen in the system, the disease feeds on estrogen. Got you. And so... The okay, so the surgery. So you say it's worse than cancer um, surgery. My my dad, um, who I lost to having metastatic uh, appendix cancer that went through his abdomen, he had to have a lot of his like bowel removed and ended up getting a colostomy bag. Is that something that could also happen with endo? Could you have to have yeah. so much of your bowel removed that you end up absolutely, absolutely. with in a cases, colostomy bag? Endo is very low and very advanced in multiple areas in the bowel. It causes mm. obstruction and surgery may not be possible in one shot. We, we do temporary, temporary colostomy, of course. Oh, so a temporary. It's, it's not uncommon. It does happen. It's, is it ever permanent, a permanent colostomy bag? Well, there may be cases, in, there okay. are cases, very difficult cases, we know, unfortunately. In the, in the worst, in the worst cases. In the worst scenario, there are cases, unfortunately. Right. So it can really, it can endometriosis. In my mind, the way I'm understanding it is it, it is metastatic. Like it spreads through your body. Yeah. It is, it is, meta, it is, uh, invasive. Let's put it that way. Yeah. When you say metastatic, it really jumps everywhere from brain to everywhere else. But endo is more contained, but it's very invasive in the peritoneal Got cavity you. in the abdomen. Yeah. Got you. And then That's so this is very important from if you know the disease. If, if individual understands the disease, they make their decision very intelligently on time. Yeah. And I think it that's helps what... the doctor to make the decision too. You know, for, you don't have to really convince if the best, best way of uh, treating the disease is creating awareness and education. Yeah. Then, then you can exercise your, your surgical profession. Otherwise, if you exercise your surgical on a patient that doesn't understand the disease, it really creates significant confusion. Uh, it's not, so I make them read a book. I have a book, Doctor Will See You Now. It's one of the best sellers. Uh, Doctor Will See You world. Now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's really the story of so many patients. It, it creates incredible self uh, understanding people identify with those cases. Yeah, that's me, that's me. The most important thing, especially after surgery, is validation and of, of, the, of their years of suffering, vindication of that, the feeling of they are right, everybody mm. was wrong. 
especially these biopsies showing like an evidence it represents their disease. That's why I, I, I remove every lesion separately. It goes to pathology and read by a pathologist under microscope, independent of my, what I saw. She sees things and she verifies as an evidence. That's very important. I mean, woman really judges you like you're in court, you know, <laughs> it's an evidence. Yeah. Removing the tissue and shows on the pathology report. And we, I also videotape the whole surgery. I give it, I review it with the patient. I educate them. Look, this was your appendix. We removed here. This was your bowel. This was your vagina. And that's to say we removed there. This was your tube. This was the bowel or this was on your diaphragm. Wow. They say, Oh, I never knew. Now it's out. They feel better and the confidence and trust level of trust. Based on this transparency, I think yeah. there's no measure as far as doctor patient relationship, how for well sure it there. works for, for, for care. I mean, yeah. I, I feel, I feel incredibly satisfied, especially when the patient mind is treated and they, they're yeah. happy. That's the, that's wow. the key. And they can yeah. bear some part of the pain. Trust me, they accept that, but it's the, the whole, Psychology of accepting and understanding is so powerful. Mm. Yeah. In other words, they really lose, gain their female power by containing and be over handling it in a right way. I think it is a very psychologically very good uh, outcome, in my opinion. So we got to stop being so tough as women. And just listen to our bodies and be more intuitive and know that it's okay to go and get help and be aware of these. Like, this is, this is the reason why we do this podcast is exactly. so that we can I mean, bring this awareness. Tough, you got to be tough with knowledge and yeah. science behind it. Tough yeah. being, just being heroically tough, We're, you know, bodily is not enough physically tough. exactly there's so much information out there i think that's also can get confusing at times but we wanted to offer like a vetted um source of information which is why we're talking to you um is there anything else that you think that we need to know women of all ages whoever's listening to this podcast even men husbands partners children sons moms dads about this disease? Well, well, I think if you're, I mean, I really appreciate for you giving me a chance to express my side of the story. Mm. And I think that we're, we're really pushing this um, concept is much more than one in 10. It involves mm. the, uh, the husband, the boyfriend, the mother, father, grandparents, children, the, the boss, you know, so yeah. we have to early in early detection is the best prevention. Endometriosis is associated with ovarian cancer. It is in some ovarian cancer, it is considered even precursor for many other aspects. Endometriosis is the disease of this century and the future of the modern mm -hmm. woman. If mm -hmm. I mean, and our, our, uh, the art, the basically the future of our society ba is based on maternal and female health. Let's make it very clear. Yeah. We, we, we want healthy women, healthy mothers, healthy girlfriends, healthy wives. You know, I think healthy that, that, that makes healthy men also. And yeah. I think many bases of many disagreements between men and women, especially has to do with sex has a lot misunderstanding what what pain is during sex is it's not that woman is rejecting man you know it's there's so much misunderstanding around that that issue as one can imagine right yeah. so in that sense uh endo uh, uh, affects every layer of our lives every horizontal and vertical layer longitudinally to every stage in life it is mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. even when we grow up being grandparents, it involves our grandchildren. So in that sense, Nicole Tramfio, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening to The Village Podcast, where we share unique stories from all walks of life. 
normalizing conversations and experiences in pregnancy, childbirth, postpartum, and motherhood. We are here to serve, and we really want to hear from you. So feel free to share, comment, like, and subscribe to keep this village growing. We are eternally grateful for you being with us and sharing space today.